So this is, uh, of course, amazing, and we are very much looking forward to your talk, Tom. So welcome at the CSCC today. Well, I'm not sure how to respond. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm myself, I'm very happy to have been here for the last week. I mean, to me, Mont it, it's the inverse. To me, Montreal is the place where basically all my research interests are bundled in a few universities at the same time. And I finally got to meet some new people, some old people I already knew but never had contact in this and that. And so I've been very happy to have been here. Um, now with regards to this talk, I'm, I'm going to work for the next few years on the consequences of political trust. And related to that, I try to wrap up my ideas about the causes, or especially the macro level causes of political trust over the last few years. Um, and that's basically what my presentation will be about. It's a combination of um, three studies that I did, but also related in a more in a broader framework um, on the causes of political trust, and especially some paradoxical effects uh, that we already knew existed, trying to solve those, and some new paradoxical effects of my own added to the mix um, that are still inconclusive in the end. Um, first, let me briefly lay out the state of political trust and political trust research. Um, political trust is commonly understood to be very important to modern day democracy. Top down, um, it's relevant because it leads to easier policy implementation. People would agree to uh, laws even if, they, uh, if, even if they don't like the laws themselves. So it's good for the implementation of public policy. It's the oil um, that lubricates the policy machine. At the same time, it would bind society and politics together. Therefore, it's also the glue that keeps the system together. However, in recent years, it's been contested whether political trust is also good from a bottom-up point of view, in the sense that democracy requires trust, but trust in the system, trust in the functioning of democracy, of the processes but not necessarily trust in the actors or in, in the institutions that they shape. Um, you want people to be skeptical about the actors. You want them to be skeptical about the institutions because we know that that is what drives citizen participation, for instance, in elections and outside elections. Um, so the, the, the traditional idea that a, any decline in political trust, especially a decline in political trust um, in institutions would be bad, is nowadays uh, contested. Political trust could be understood, I think, in, in by contrasting it to some other aspects. Trust, first and foremost, is a relationship. It's not just the characteristics of a person. You will never ever say, I trust. That's a very strange thing to say, even though in the literature we always discuss trusting citizens, not really emphasizing the subject. Trust is a relationship, and according to a large stream in the literature, it's supposed to be more or less an evaluation evaluation of an object by the subject. So therefore it's a relationship that is characterized by, it's, it's determined by both characteristics of the subject and of the object. It's also situational by definition. Trust can only arise in circumstances of uncertainty, risk, and or vulnerability. It makes sense for me to say, for instance, I trust my wife. Circumstantially, I could trust her with a secret that she keeps, or I could trust her playing a board game, trusting her not to attack me in the back uh, when I'm attacking other persons. Um, that's trust. And the same basically should apply to trust in government, to trust in democracy. We don't just trust something if nothing is at stake. Trust is inherently related to uncertainty and to risk. And at the same time, the larger the risk, the larger the uncertainty, the more power the object has over you, the more difficult it is to trust. That's one of the reasons why trust in government and trust in parliament always ranks so low in all these lists of uh, trust objects. It's quite easy to trust, for instance, the radio, which is a common question in the trust battery. To what extent do you trust the radio? I don't know what it means to trust the radio, <laughs> but even if I would know what it is to me to trust the radio, sure, I trust the radio to play music, I guess, or to babble along. It's not that difficult, so it's easy to trust, so trust levels will be higher. Now, trust in politics specifically has a very precise set of objects in the literature. It's at the very minimum regime institutions, and according to some regime performers, or your satisfaction with the regime performers, those are the two objects that are conventionally considered to be political trust. It's not support for the political community, support for regime principles or values that are basically uncontested conventionally, 
nor is it support for specific office holders, specific authorities, or specific policies. Once we vote for during elections, for instance. We can also understand trust by contrasting it to the rest. Trust can be thought to consist of various aspects, competence, the idea that the other is competent enough to act in your, behavior, uh, in, in, in your behalf, uh, that the other one cares inherently for your, um, uh, your hopes, uh, accountability, that even if the other has no inherent commitment, you can force the other to be commitment, committed, and reliability or predictability. The accountability can be understood, for instance, in terms of if my wife shares my secrets with someone else, I can share her secrets. If she attacks me in the back while playing a nice board game, then I will keep on attacking her until we're both gone. That's the type of accountability. Care would suggest that she inherently wants to keep my secret, and that she inherently wants me to win at the game. So in different circumstances, different aspects would be more likable. I, I think my wife will keep my secrets because she cares. I think she will not attack me in the back because she knows she will be held accountable by me. <laughs> now, in terms of contrast, the, the positive aspect of trust is trust. The negative aspect is hardly ever measured. It's, it's mistrust, the absence of trust. But the active form it, it could take, this trust, actively not trusting something, is usually not measured. But it measure, it, it, there is a distinction between mistrust and distrust, and that's a crucial bit in between, namely skepticism. Skepticism is the attitude of wait and see. I'll base my judgment on what happens, on actual behavior. And this is a crucial aspect, and I think that, that that's the explanation of a lot of what we find in terms of trends across national differences. Now, this approach inherently is already quite cognitive, quite evaluative. It's quite rational or conscious evaluations on specific criteria. And this cognitive or evaluative approach has usually been tested um, simply by focusing on effects. If a government performs better, is trust higher? If uh, the quality of government is better, is trust higher, yes or no, etc. Purely on the effects. However, to the extent that it's really a cognitive or an evaluative approach, as is broadly assumed, the mechanisms should be tested as well. The mechanisms should then be perceptions that people have, the judgments that people have. If, for instance, economic performance is evaluated by the citizens leading to more trust, you would expect that good economic performance leads to better evaluations of economic performance by government, and that leads ultimately to political trust. Similarly, we would expect conditions. Conditions like the values I have. If I think performing well on the economy is important for a government, especially then under those conditions, the economic performance would have an effect on my level of political trust. If I don't find economic performance that important, it shouldn't have an effect. Finally, but very crucially and hardly ever discussed in literature, there are benchmarks or expectations. Sure, I might consider that I base my trust on an effective outcome, but compared to what? The, the government should perform well economically, but compared to other countries, or compared to my own idiosyncratic expectations, or compared to our own common past, what I expected from the outcome, outcomes of the economy in the last few years. This is a crucial difference. Do we make a comparison to other countries, or do we make a comparison to our own recent past? This hasn't been discussed in the literature, this hasn't been taken up. Some studies use a cross-national design, other studies use a longitudinal research design, but they ignore that the choice of design implicitly assumes either a comparison to other countries or a comparison to the own history, or a comparison to an absolute standard that exists regardless of time and place. But that one is not very likely. So this is basically what I'm going to try to discuss today. There are some paradoxical findings in there that I some I try to solve and some are new. Some general idea about political trust, again. Um, this is a map of the, uh, the most recent World Value Survey, 2010-2014. You guys aren't in there. Uh, we are. Um, however, tr levels of trust, the, the green ones are the high levels of trust, are highest in countries that we wouldn't usually classify as the most democratic countries in the world. Uh, China, uh, Kazakhstan, Hong Kong, uh, Dubai, Azerbaijan, they rank highest. Um, if we look at the countries that have relatively more established democracies, we'll find that in those countries it's quite common to have 35 to 50 percent of the people trusting government. Sweden ranks a bit higher, 
uh, countries in Eastern Europe or Poland and, and uh, Slovenia rank a bit lower, but those are basically the levels that we expect of in a democracy when it comes to trust in government and trust in parliament. We can also zoom in, in on Europe using the European Value Survey, then you see trust again being very high in the countries that are not the most democratic, like Belarus, Russia, Turkey, and again Azerbaijan. But otherwise, uh, the uh, countries in, in Nordic Europe score uh, relatively high. Iceland didn't, but this was uh, half a year after uh, the Great Recession started, and their banks fell and the government was found to be corrupt. Otherwise, these are differences that you basically expect within a subset of democracies. And then there are the longitudinal, so these are the cross national differences, and, but then there are also the longitudinal fluctuations. There is a traditional idea that trust is going down across the West. There is no very clear evidence for that except for one country, namely the US. In the US, trust has gone down since the 1960s until the 1980s. However, since then, it has fluctuated and it's going up again at the moment as we speak because people trust Obama in view of what's coming, on, coming in the future. Um, but trust has been fluctuating. In Canada, there is some evidence that, it might, that trust might have been in decline, but it's all based on one single data point uh, in the 1960s. Otherwise, measures started again in the 1990s and trust has been fluctuating. In, in the recent months with the new government, trust has increased to basically an all-time high if we ignore this strange point 25 years before the rest was measured. Are, are you always showing trust in government and parliament? Yeah, together? I'll always show trust in government and parliament unless I mention it explicitly. Sorry. And this is the EU. Um, focus now on the, um, on the lighter line. This is trust in EU on average. Came up and down and up and down. Uh, this is where the Great Recession started. Before that, there was a peak in trust across Europe. Um, surprisingly, it had gone down since, but again, fluctuations are the story, not so much. Um, I have never been called the whole week. <laughs> Let's turn it off, I'm so sorry. Now, these fluctuations are the real story. Um, and these fluctuations are also the story in, in, in most of the countries that these fluctuations seem to be increasing in a way, in many countries. And that suggests that citizens might be turning skeptical. They re tend to respond to what's going on. They tend to respond to who is in government, how do they govern, govern what are the performances, what's their image. So people becoming, are becoming more responsive to the macro level characteristics. Now given that, there are some dilemmas in there. This is the first that I'm going to present. It's uh, going to be published in Political Studies later this year. Political Trust as the Evaluation of Process and Performance, a cross-national study of 42 European democracies. So there's this wide literature on uh, subjective evaluations of economic performance, subjective evaluations, and they find a consistently very strong relationship with political trust. So we know that your own opinion on the eco economy tends to be strongly related to political trust. And the early literature on actual macroeconomic performance finds similar effects. However, more recently, these effects do not seem to hold anymore especially in studies that control for corruption at the macro level. The cross-national differences seem to be explained primarily, um, sorry, not by economic performance, but primarily by degree of corruption and the proportionality of the electoral system. Those are the two major drives of the explanation. So what's going on with economic performance? This is basically the first part of a three article uh, run that I made in, in the last few years. The idea about behind economic performance is if government performs better, trust would be higher. And there are some conventional indicators like economic development, no one could be against economic development, economic growth, and unemployment rates. Everyone loves low unemployment rates, is the idea. But there are some challenges. Um, we don't find these effects in these cross-national surveys. Why not? What's going on? Well, first let us be sure that it's really not there in the cross-national surveys. For that, I'm, I am doing the most encompassing test that I could imagine given that I want to have reliable data using the European Value Survey, where I set the macroeconomic performance measures against uh, the more procedural aspects of government, corruption, uh, electoral system, stuff like that. I use a much wider range of more specific indicators than before on government's economic performance. I tested on a wider range of countries, including newly established democracies of, of Central and Eastern Europe. 
I focus both on trust in the political regime, satisfaction with democracy, and trust in the political institutions, government and parliament. And I think crucially, I try to model the conditional effects that I mentioned before. If economic performance would matter, you would think it matters with the values that people have. How did I do it? Um, I used the European Value Survey of 2008, with, which contained 47 countries. Uh, 48 ones I split West and East Germany, just to be sure. I then deselected six for various reasons, uh, because they simply were not democracies, or because no reliable data was available, or because they were uh, unclear, semi-occupied territories, um, like Northern Cyprus, which is always very contested. Um, the political trust measure is based on trust in government, trust in parliament, and besides that, I focus on satisfaction with democracy, with which here is a dichotomous measure. I did multi-level research, two levels, individuals in their 42 countries, and I could use regular OLS and logistic regression analysis. And I did a lot of robustness checks, uh, a study of residuals. I might come to that later. There are some problems with these data. Um, first of all, there is a time range of interviews that differs. Um, most countries interviews were held before September 2008. Lehman Brothers was crucial in understanding European response to the Great Recession. Before that, there was no fear in Europe. It was not like in the US where fears were building up before that already. It wasn't there. It only started then. But there are some countries, three in total, where data collection was after uh, September 2008. But even after eliminating that, this didn't affect the findings. And for some countries, the quality of the data is kind of unknown. We're not definitely sure about the cross-national equivalence of our measures. But even then, if I try to limit this, uh, the size of the sample, I find no problems. In terms of measures, I use economic development, economic growth, inflation, unemployment, uh, rates, uh, government credit and debt, and uh, inequality as an additional one. Uh, the inflation and government credit versus debt is, are relatively new. Uh, in the literature, they have been used once or twice, but not that consistently. So it's a broader range of um, measures. I control for corruption, as perceived by experts, the, via the Transparency International and the electoral system. And also, I did some checks what would happen if I would inc include civil and political rights, uh, the executive, um, the, the characteristics of the executive, and what the regime was like a generation ago in the 1970s. A range of control variables, but well, they didn't affect anything. First, the descriptives. This is basically the figure that I already showed you, but now differently. Uh, this is, first of all, satisfaction with democracy in these 48 countries. It was highest in Azerbaijan. People in Azerbaijan really like their democracy, whatever that means. Um, but otherwise, Switzerland, Denmark, Cyprus, Luxembourg, Norway, Kosovo, they all rank very high. The countries of uh, Southeastern Europe are ranked lowest at the bottom, like Bulgaria. Albania, Ukraine, Serbia, Hungary, and others. If we focus on um, trust in national political institutions, governments, and parliaments, we find that there are some overlaps in ranking, but they're not as clear cut. So they do tap into something else, at least in my models, in my uh, models at level two. Uh, for instance, you find that in West Germany, satisfaction with government and parliament is lower than you would expect, given the trust that they have in uh, the system. Uh, similarly, Russia is very happy with government, despite their level of satisfaction with democracy. So, onto the outcomes. Um, the first step is, of course, is there an effect? That's basically the same literature. And if you look at all these, e these economic determinants as the sole determinant um, at level two, then I find a lot of significant effects on satisfaction in the expected directions, usually, and of confidence, I find a lot of uh, effects. Only economic growth is kind of weird. The larger economic growth, the lower the level of satisfaction with democracy. Kind of weird, but it's because there's a clear negative relationship to economic development that explains it. So these are all significant effects. Here we find significant effects, but what happens once we in include level of corruption? Basically everything drops out in the first stage or in the second stage. All the effects of economic performance drop out once I only include level of corruption. Corruption trumps everything, basically everything economic in these cross-national models. Corruption is the thing that drives the effects most clearly. The only effect that still remains is the effect of uh, economic inequality over here.
Yeah. When you say the effect uh, drop, I mean the, the, the that's your non-significance. Sorry. Okay, they're not significant, but they become yeah, they they become non-significant. How do you measure corruption? The corruption is measured by by the index from Transparency International, which is basically done by the experts uh, in in a lot of countries, and it's robust to various other uh, options. But I'm going to come back to the corruption and what it really means later. The size in, in what sense? The government, so the, the, the share of uh, public spending in the GDP, for example. It didn't do that much, surprisingly. Okay. Um, but I wasn't too sure about I, I did that uh, before this study, in fact. Um, I wasn't too sure about that because the measures of size of government in terms of GDP, um, collected, for instance, by IMF, aren't that reliable, not, not, not as reliable as I wanted them to be. Um, because of semi-governmental institutes and how to measure those, for instance, it, it wasn't as clear-cut. Crucially, I think, are the conditional effects as well. You would expect um, that some aspects of economic performance matter more to left-wing people than to right-wing people, and vice versa. Uh, inflation and unemployment, uh, sorry, unemployment rates is typically a left-wing uh, idea. Uh, inflation uh, and uh, budgetary balance are more right-wing preferences conventionally. However, I find no significant interaction effects except for one where the marginal effects remain non-significant. Which basically means regardless of the values you have, there is no significant marginal effect. These are still the models without control for corruption. Once I include corruption, all these marginal effects disappear as well. There is no conditionality of the, of the non-finding of economic performance in these cross-national models. It's just not there. So summing up, economic performance indicators do not explain very much of the cross-national differences in political tr trust. Only deficits, or if you model differently, uh, the inequality, uh, harm satisfaction in cross-national studies. Processes matter more. Corruption and proportionalism that I didn't show in this presentation, they have an effect. And the effects are not <coughs> contingent on left-right values. This could be a blow to the idea of political trust as an evaluation. However, I made a crucial assumption in the first study. And the assumption is that people base that trust on a cross-national comparison. Or at least that to the extent that economic performance has an effect, it's based on this cross-national comparison. So let's delve into this economic performance paradox even further. So the earlier cross-sectional studies suggest a consistent effect of economic performance on political trust. Recent multi-level studies find no such effect after controlling for corruption, and I can I showed that it's indeed including that as a control variable that indeed lets the original effect uh, turn non-significant. So it's a spurious effect that we originally found. The impact of actual economic performance in these, especially in cross-national studies, is at best contested. But at the same time, perceptions of economic performance, longitudinal evaluations, consumer satisfaction, all these measures, all these subjective measures, are very strongly and consistently related to political trust. So there seems a mismatch. The objective thing doesn't seem to hold. Subjectively, it does seem to hold. Now, as I said before, these cross-sectional analyses that are dominant in the literature, especially over the last 15 years, they assume that citizens evaluate their national political performance by comparing their country to other countries by comparing the Netherlands to um, Bosnia, or to Serbia, or even to Germany. But the question is whether people do that. Citizens might base their evaluation on a longitudinal capital comparison instead. Their own past. What did I expect, given my own past? In Greece, unemployment levels have always been high. Rising unemployment might lead to negative effect on political trust, not because un unemployment is higher than it is in, I don't know, Germany, because it's always been higher than Germany, but because it's higher than it had been before. That might be the relevant comparison for political trust. So, new questions. To what extent does macroeconomic performance influence the trust that citizens have in their national government over time? And to what extent did the Great Recession affect the level of political trust and its relationship to macroeconomic performance? I'm going to now focus on the longitudinal comparison instead. How to do that? Uh, I, here I could use the Eurobarometer which uh, covered measures of political trust, trust in government, and trust in parliament in 15 countries since 1999. 
So I've got 15 uh, EU countries, the first 15 EU member states. Uh, that means there are no Central or Eastern European countries in there. Um, Finland and Austria, that's as far east as it goes, and Greece. Um, there are 21 waves, so I've got 15 countries with 21 waves each, um, except for Greece that misses the last wave, so there's one with 20. Uh, 240,000 respondents, 314 country waves combined. The dependent variable was a dichotomized measure of trust in national government and parliament. And I did a check to see if I would separate those, whether that would change my findings. And I control for a range of individual level determinants. Now, how to build this into a test of the longitudinal design? Because there's also a clear cross-national element in this. I use time variant indicators, indicators that change over time, based on Eurostat of unemployment, economic growth, inflation rate, budget surplus. But I also looked at corruption and whether elections have taken place as control variables. So the corruption measure is basically a measure um, of whether, according to Transparency International, corruption went up or down. And the elections are simply whether the election took place. I include all these determinants with a six month lag. And I did a robustness check to see whether it matters whether I did a zero month lag or even inverted lag. And I centered all these measures within the countries. So I've got 21 ways within each country. All these measures show no difference across countries, they only show differences within countries. Now, in terms of model setup, there are four potentially relevant levels of analysis. I've got countries, the differences between countries, and I eliminate that variance in two ways. I eliminate it by me centering the independent variables within each country, so they can't differ within country anymore. And just to be sure, I also added country dummies as independent variables. So I also include for each country except for one a dummy to uh, identify them. So there's no cross-national difference in my model anymore. A second level of analysis is the waves. I've got 21 waves. It might be that at the same time trust goes up or trust goes down in those waves. Like, for instance, after 9-11, when we had this rally around the flag across Western countries, and trust went up in all the countries. I'm not interested in those, those joint waves. So that variance is eliminated by adding wave dummies. Then there are two waves, two, two levels left, namely country wave combinations and the individual respondents within those com uh, country wave combinations. That means all the variance I have is longitudinal within countries, and now I can make the comparison that I want to make. I have a multi-level model with two levels and a range of dummy uh, variables to control. Now, what you find then is economy matters after all. By the way, I should say before this, I first ran a cross-national model, eliminating time, and just focusing on the cross-national comparison, then again, economic performance didn't matter, regardless of at which time I took it, or if I took the pool data set, economic performance didn't matter. In the longitudinal models, it mattered quite a bit. Basically, I find consistent effects of economic growth with a six-month lag, and of the unemployment rate with a six-month lag. And even when I add corruption to the model, using the CPI, which again has an effect in the expected direction, the original effects of economic performance still hold. So those two have a rather stable effect, growth and unemployment rate. Corruption has an effect, and we know that if recently elections took place, trust in the government or parliament is higher. It's not time in office. It's not time in office that matters. That effect is not significant. It's really the elections themselves that seem to matter. Second thing we want to check, okay, there has been this great recession. Has there been an, an, an added effect uh, of the recession itself, that since the, re the recession, people simply lost confidence? Um, again, this is the line that I already showed you. It's the gray line is the regular line that we found before, and the great recession starts and trust goes down. However, once we take economic performance into account, there is no additional effect anymore of being in the great recession. Basically, trust, except for two down points and one high point, more or less fits the trend line that you would expect according to um, um, the, the, regu the regular model. The model itself didn't really change that much uh, before or after the Great Recession. Now, those who are with me tomorrow already saw this uh, table. Um, I also checked whether some effects changed across time. The effect of budgetary surpluses um, changed uh, since the recession. If I make a distinction between the effect of budgetary surpluses before and after the Great Recession, before having a surplus had a positive effect, 
after it had no positive effect anymore. That suggests that the Great Recession changed that. I mean, that's why I perhaps didn't find the overall effect, but now I, I did. However, I could find that this was all due to one case, Ireland. Because of Ireland, the people in Ireland no longer cared for the budgetary deficit in their country. They had a huge deficit after the Great Recession. Their banks collapsed. Uh, they had the, the largest drop off in on, on all economic measures, larger than Greece, for instance. Um, but it was an external threat. It was extraordinary conditions. So perhaps that's the reason why the budgetary surpluses weren't that relevant to them anymore. If I would exclude the influence of Ireland, then I don't find this interaction effect anymore. I did a whole range of robust structures that I just mentioned, different lags, um, separating the dependent variable, um, perturbation analysis to check for uh, multicollinearity, everything was fine. The most interesting, interesting thing to do was mentioned to us by a reviewer, and I'm really grateful to the reviewer about that, saying, well, in your model, you make a longitudinal comparison. However, strictly speaking, you're also comparing um, people who live in 2008 to people who are living in 2012. So you're not just only looking backwards, you're also comparing them forwards in a way. And we said, yeah, well, but it's also partly because um, there are probably established levels that are rather consistent across time. But we had to agree the reviewer was right. What we then did is we checked what would uh, happen if um, we compared the performance of six months ago compared to the average performance of the two and a half years, or sorry, of the two years before that. So what's the state of the economy compared to what the state of the economy was in the last two years before that. And then we find even some stronger effects that we haven't expected. Again, emphasizing that indeed this longitudinal comparison, that's probably where it's at. That's probably where the information is. So the conclusion would be that actual economic performance does matter after all. However, the relevant benchmark, the relevant comparison is not cross-national, it's longitudinal. People compare to their own past. These findings are robust under a wide range of diagnostics. And possibly and circumstantially, um, Europeans may be Canadians by heart because they care less about deficits. However, or simply the austerity debate might have changed things, however, only under, under extraordinary circumstances. But that's a bit for future research. So that's the first part, that's the part on, on the state of the economy, the, the whole paradoxical idea that the economy matters in some studies and it doesn't in others, might simply be because we changed the benchmark. Um, and we need to take that into account more and more. People don't make an absolute comparison, people make comparison to something they themselves consider relevant. Now, a second thing that I mentioned before was this relevance of the mechanisms and the relevance of the, the conditions under which um, we expect to find effects. And personally, I've always been very unsatisfied with the effect of corruption. By definition, corruption should be bad for government because corrupt societies are just bad. That's inherent in what even the word corrupt means. That, that those are societies or, or governments that are incompetent to deal with that, that don't care for ordinary citizens, that can't be held accountable, that aren't reliable, and all characteristics, that's just not good, right? So we want to delve into that and see to what extent this really has an effect and to what extent we can explain the effects via mechanisms. In the last few years, there has been an increased uh, focus on quality of government in the political trust literature, usually focusing uh, on, on quality of government and perceptions uh, thereof at the individual level or at the meso level. What I try to do here is include it at the, at the macro level. According to the Quality of Government Institute, or Bo Rothstein and, and Jan Teurel, impartiality is the benchmark of what quality of government is like. Impartiality um, treat different groups equally you can, basically all the else follows from that, like procedural fairness, neutrality, professionalization, rule of law, transparency. There are all more or less aspects of this first bit, namely impartiality. So the question that I ask in this final paper um, is first, to what extent does quality of government explain cross-national variation in political support? Then, focus on the causal chain. To what extent is the effect of quality of government intermediated or explained by citizens' evaluation of the quality of government. If <coughs> people really evaluate that, it should be intermediated by their evaluations. 
and to what extent is the effective quality of government moderated by or dependent on citizens' subjective values of quality of government. Not everyone thinks gov quality of government is important. Not everyone thinks impartiality is important. But if this is an evaluation, we should expect to find differences. So I've got some direct hypotheses. A higher degree of impartiality of the executive, strong enforcement of the rule of law, and professionalism of state bureaucracy should all stimulate political support. That's the term I have to use in this paper because of the editors, but I really mean political trust. Um, absence of corruption is positively related to political support. The, inter uh, sorry, the, the intermediation effect, the relationship between quality of government and political support is mediated by evaluations of impartiality, rule of law, and professionalism. And the more citizens consider impartiality, rule of law, and professionalism important for democracy, the stronger the positive relationship between quality of government and political support. I could use the European Social Survey 2012 for that because that's the survey that has the best uh, mediating variables. They are not optimal, but they are the best available. Uh, it covers 30 European countries across the continent, as well as Israel. I exclude three. Cyprus for missing data, Kosovo for being a transition state, and Russia for being non-democratic, and as it turned out, uh, also an influential case. I just checked whether I could elaborate on my original model. As dependent variables, I focus on satisfaction with democracy, trust in parliament, and trust in the legal system. With a range, the, the scores on that uh, range from zero, extremely dissatisfied, or no trust at all for those two measures, to extremely satisfied or complete trust. So I could use linear regression analysis. Now onto the mediators. They are, again, I must say, they're not ideal. But they come quite close to some ideas that I have. Um, there's a huge battery in the European Social Survey of 2012 um, on what people think is important to democracy and how they evaluate um, the presence of those aspects in their own democracy. So it's the importance of, in this case, I use five of the 16 aspects to democracy in general. The importance ranges from zero, not at all important, to 10, extremely important. And the applicability thereof, ranging from zero, does not apply at all to 10, applies completely. And the five aspects that I focus on are National elections are free and fair. Opposition parties are free to criticize the government. The media are free to, free, uh, to criticize the government. The rights of minority groups are protected and the courts treat everyone the same. They are not direct measures of the impartiality of the uh, executive, of throughput of the state bureaucracy. However, they all tend to measure the procedural aspects of democracy. At the input side, I would have liked better measures, but this is as close as I can get. So they're clearly suboptimal measures better ones I haven't seen yet. Um, as moderators, I use uh, um, the, sorry, the, the importance of 16 aspects uh, when folks impartiality is national elections are free and fair and the courts treat everyone the same. For rule of law, you could focus on those. It's not necessarily that clear cut. When it comes to the contextual level data, impartiality of government, I use that to try to break down the original corruption effect to see what's really going on behind the screens. And there's this excellent expert survey by the Quality of Government Institute that you might already know, uh, the expert survey. And it contains five questions on the impartiality of the executive and of the state bureaucracy. Um, they also, uh, the rule of law is derived from Freedom House 2010. Like uh, it covers, uh, amongst other, civil control of the police, protection from terror, unjustified imprisonment, equal treatment, and professionalism of the state bureaucracy. Again, the rest from the expert survey with four questions on how people get their position in the state bureaucracy. Is it politicized? Yes or no? For corruption, I again use the Corruption Perception Index by Transparency International. And then I use control variables, economic development, um, just I know it won't have an effect and it didn't again have an effect, but just to be sure, and the proportionality of the electoral system, basically what we now tend to consider the usual suspects. Let's look at the effect, the direct and immediate effects. First, a very surprising thing. Here are the models, impartiality of the executive, corruption. The effect of corruption is non-significant. It has been the single consistent finding I had seen in the literature that corruption has a significant effect on political trust. It doesn't once we take the impartiality of the executive into account. So it's, it's specifically the impartiality of the executive that drives the effect, not corruption as a whole. Now, 
what does it mean? The, the theoretical relationship between the two, it's not clear whether it's a spurious or an intermediate effect. Uh, I hear some of you thinking, well, this might be multilinearity. It isn't, as I explained this morning, and I'll show you in a second. Uh, but this is very surprising. It's the impartiality of the executive that drives the huge effect of the quality of government on political trust. Then the question, the rest basically doesn't, or hardly does, but does this, these effects decrease with evaluations? Somewhat. The effects of impartiality of the executive on satisfaction with democracy decreases with about a quarter. Um, here as well, about, uh, with, with about a quarter, and here almost with 50%, once I control for the potential mechanisms. I'm not sure what to make of that. It suggests some mediation, but it's not that convincing because the drop-off is quite low. At the same time, the measures aren't that good anyway. So I'm really not sure what to make of this. However, what I am sure what to make of it are the conditional effects. Here we have from left to right the impartiality of the executive. Uh, vertically, this is satisfaction with democracy. And I have two groups here. I, I just drew two groups. These are the predicted scores, and uh, the, 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 the straight lines and the curved lines are the 95% confidence intervals. This group, this flat group, for whom impartiality of the executive has no effect, is the group who considers uh, on all these measures um, the impartiality of democracy to be not important, ranging from zero to six. So anyone who scored a zero to six on those variables, flatlines here. This is the group who scores a 10, that's about half of the group anyway. For them, the impartiality of the executive has a huge effect. I mean, for cross-national survey research, increasing the mean from 3.5 to almost 7 on, a, on an 11 point scale is, is huge. So there is a very clear and very evident conditional effect based on the values that people themselves have, suggesting that perhaps there is something to this evaluative approach. I find the same when I focus on trust in Parliament. Again, a flat line and a clearer effect. The effect is uh, less steep, but it's also because the levels of trust in government are lower. So there's the ceiling is lower anyway. In terms of explained variance, it does the same. Yeah. What's the scale on the impartiality of the executive? It, it, it ranges from, from, these are the extremes, anyway, on the scale. And what's the distribution of the extremes? Like, are there cases out there? They're, they're, yeah, sorry. These are, these are the, the empirical uh, extremes, uh, not the theoretical extremes. And there are cases there, most of the cases, there's a nice spread on this uh, variable anyway. And finally, for trust in the legal system, again, a flat line for those who score between zero and six, and a very clear effect amongst those who find um, the impartiality of the democracy very important. Again, these are not the ideal measures, to be sure. Nevertheless, I find these very strong effects. Then there's some robustness checks to see what's going on. Um, in this case, um, people of this morning will undoubtedly recognize it. I did some perturbation analysis to check for multicollinearity. Um, added some random noise to my effects to see whether uh, if in 100 new estimates of my original models with 100 times different uh, measures with some random noise, I would still find the same effects. And the effects are very robust, except for the effect of, law, uh, of, of lack of corruption that isn't very, co that's the sole effect of corruption that I found. It's only significant in 50% of the cases in my robustness check. So that effect, this only effect that I found of corruption isn't that reliable anyway. What does that mean? Well, if I go back to the hypothesis, I find that it's primarily impartiality that matters. The absence of corruption is positively related to political support well, only on one dependent variable, and even then not that reliable, so I wouldn't go there. The relationship is mediated well, to some extent, but not that impressive. But there is a very clear and strong conditionality. So this is where the new paradox comes in, I think. I find some evidence for the cognitive evaluative approach, but other parts are simply are not that convincing. 
So in conclusion, um, some takeaway messages. First of all, benchmarks matter. Um, seemingly it makes sense and it's, it's, it's a truism, but given the state of the literature it isn't. Take benchmarks into account, know why you model stuff either cross-nationally or longitudinally. Um, second, the evaluative approach finds mixed support. The mechanisms remain unclear. And we really need to delve into that to really understand what trust is. But there is quite strong effects, I would say, that the effects that we find are conditional on people's values, that values do matter. However, they can only matter in perspectives on which the effects the matter. So the benchmarks come first. I didn't find effects, uh, these conditionalities for economic performance. But I based those analyses on cross-national studies rather than longitudinal studies, where I couldn't do the same thing. Summing up the whole literature, uh, going a bit beyond the current study, um, there are basically three levels of macro micro explanation when it comes to political trust. Three sets of causes, sorry, three sets of macro level causes for political trust. First, there are the structural explanations. They are like the cork on which trust floats. There are first and foremost quality of government or lack of corruption. And secondly, proportionalism. Those are the two most important structural explanations. Uh, those are the ones that explain cross-national differences. They are the ones that explain cross-national differences over time as well. Proportionalism, by the way, has this effect, even though it's low on accountability, it's strong on inclusiveness and on care. Minority groups are included. Um, people who are disaffected with, uh, with the current established parties are able to uh, get their own opposition party elected. And that's why proportionalism has this effect. Then we have the cyclical explanations, basically the tides on which the corx goes up and down in regular intervals. They, they are first and foremost economic performance within countries, not between countries. Elections, every election time trust goes up again, only to decrease and decrease and decrease again over the next few years, to go back up again when elections take place. And endemic scandals, that's what we found as well. If scandals are so big, they hit the heart of politics that they become endemic, at least for a few years time, then um, trust goes down. There are some examples of that, by the way. So I'm not, I'm not talking about the structural quality of government, but endemic scandals. Um, like uh, the Brit British in, in, in late 2000s had a scandal about uh, declaring their receipts and uh, the tax deductibility of private houses of people in government and rebuilding that and stuff. It was weird. Uh, the Belgians had, had, a, had, a, had an endemic scandal that um, um, in, at the same, in, in the same year, um, the prime minister was connected to a corruption scandal with buying uh, choppers, helicopters. And there was a child molester uh, was caught who had molested a large number of children. It was a huge scandal, but then who also had inexplicable ties to the justice system and even to politics. Both occurred at the same time, and trust was just gone in the late 1990s. It was 6%, and then it went back up again. Hungary is also an example, but there are quite a few of those. Finally, there are temporal, short-term explanations at the micro level, the waves on which the cork uh, floats. Those are general images, but also short-term scandals, short-term images in terms of scandalization. When do scandals become endem endemic scandals? Well, this is not my study, but this is a very, very good recent study um, showed that um, scandals only have endemic effects on citizens' uh, opinions on politics if they hit the heart of what politics is all about and if they cover both government and opposition parties at the same time. As long as only one of the two groups is affected, people can consider it as unique to the actor. If it's both parties, then it becomes endemic and part of the system itself. That's basically where I stand right now. This is an overview of some of the recent studies. Not everything is as conclusive as I hoped it would be, but for the next few years, I try to focus more on the consequences anyway. Thank you.